Mayor Villaraigosa says the city of L.A. reduced its water consumption by a record-setting 17 percent in July compared to the same month last year. The mayor has restricted sprinkler use and introduced strict regulations about when residents can use water outside. Darlene is one of a dozen water cops whose job it is to enforce them. The reason why we're out here is because we're in a drought right now and we need to educate our customers to let them know that we need to conserve water. Water is precious. LA is in its third year of drought. Not that you can tell by looking at its verdant lawns. Almost 40% of water in LA is used outdoors. But that's something which is going to have to change. As the snowpack in California melts earlier, that is going to put high stress on the water supplies down here. The lawns are going to be probably a thing of history in another 50 years. What's Kentucky bluegrass doing in a desert anyway? Are you the owner of the house? Yes, I am. We got a complaint that someone said that you had your water sprinklers on other than the two days that are allowed. Oh, is that right? Yes, and I was here to let you know if, if it was possible for you to just have them on for Mondays and Thursdays because we're in a drought right now. Yeah, I was actually trying, thinking about putting a synthetic lawn in. A real that, <laughs> that would definitely be your answer, wouldn't it? <laughs> he is not the only homeowner having to defend himself. Okay, you got it. Also denying accusations is the city's mayor. Turns out the mayor's sprinklers have been running all night long. He says he has not. We believe that somebody actually turned on our sprinklers at night. Uh, I can tell you, that, and, and the evidence of that is that uh, I've had, a, in the last two years, a 70% reduction in water use due to irrigation and a 67% reduction in water use in the home. So there's no way we could have had that going on. And if you went to my home, you'd see a very brown lawn there. Water has long been known as blue gold in Los Angeles. But while the city prepares for too little, it also needs to protect against too much. Sea level rise is going to be a problem all around the world. Also the fact that if we're going to have warmer oceans, that means that sometimes it pumps up the intensity of storms. So the number of times that a storm comes by and pushes a wall of water a few feet higher is going to be more. Now, it may not be more every year, but once in a while, you're going to get a real doozy. The port of Los Angeles has 43 miles of waterfront, exposed to an increasingly volatile Pacific Ocean. It's the busiest port in America. Over 2,000 ships dock here every year, bringing with them a quarter of all goods which enter this country. Millions of people across the nation depend on the port for work. And many of its motion pictures are filmed on its keys. The Port of Los Angeles is a major backdrop for the motion picture industry. Our governor, uh, his last film, End of Days, was filmed uh, over here at Warehouse Number One. End of Days might be something people want to see in the cinemas, but not on their streets. Rising seas, however, make it a very real threat. If the ocean continues to rise, a big part of Los Angeles will be underwater. Uh, our port will be underwater. Uh, just think about this, 44% of all the seaborne goods entering the United States through our ports. Uh, think about the economic implications. We'd lose a billion dollars a day. The port has been one of the heaviest users of fossil fuels in the city. Now, it's the biggest focus of its efforts to clean up its act. Los Angeles is the Venice of the 21st century. Our Clean Air Action Plan at the port is the most far-reaching effort to clean up a port, not just in the United States, but the world. The port has introduced a clean truck program, which has resulted in a 70% reduction in air emissions since 2007. It is also pioneering electric trucks and the world's first ever all singing, all dancing hybrid tug.
It's also made sure that when ships come from outside the port, they have the option of shunning diesel for electric plug sockets. AMP is uh, an acronym for Alternative Maritime Power. And basically, when a uh, ship arrives in the port, uh, it ties up its lines and everything, and then it will actually shift over to shore power or electrical power off the Department of Water and Power power grid, very much like we plug into an electrical receptacle in our wall. Uh, that's the simplest. 20% of the port's overall budget is now devoted to green schemes. It's part of a city tackling climate change with all guns blazing. But then this is a place which can afford it. Los Angeles is a very, very wealthy city. We have a very, very large economy here in California. What troubles me are those large cities in other parts of the world, which are nations with not as well endowed with wealth. And we'll have to face these challenges without the type of financial resources that we might be able to bring to bear. Naravi in Mumbai, the largest slum in Asia, home to a million people. It's places like this which will bear the full brunt of any climate change disaster. You worry about LA, I worry about the mega cities in the mega deltas of Asia. For us, it's only going to cost money. For them, it's going to cost lives. There's no telling what the death toll could be. If I said that 200,000 people in Mumbai could die, nobody could challenge me, and yet everybody could challenge me. So I'd put it like this, we don't know. But we know this, that it's not going to be a better life, it's going to be a worse life. Blue gold, already in short supply here, just as in Los Angeles, is expected to become scarcer as global temperatures rise. For Maduka, water means risking a fine. For people in the slums, it means risking lives. It's going to be a capital where people will be forced to move away because there won't be enough water and climate change will be the actor that will force this to happen. Not just Mumbai city, not just LA, but every city in the world, the instrument of the life or death of the city is going to be water. And what we're going to find is that we're going to be, you know, in India, you'll find people praying for water and invoking the gods and things. And when it comes, you'll be praying to tell God that don't send so much. So we're going to have, uh, you, know, fam you know, feast and famine, you know, that's, that's, that's written into the future of cities like Mumbai in terms of water. It's predicted that the same scene will be acted out across the world stage. The crucial difference will be the player's budget. There's always a very uneven distribution of winners and losers, and part of the adaptation schemes that we'll have to have is how do we manage the unfairness in the distribution of who is hurt by climate change. All countries in the world should come together, whether they are rich countries, they are poor countries. They should 
come together and think this problem very seriously. We can help each other because this is not one country pro problem. This is the global problem. So each uh, country should get united for this problem. We're going to need a lot of money if we're going to ward off the worst impacts of climate change. And it makes perfect good sense for the whole world to demand that those countries that put the carbon up in the first place over the last hundred years get their act together and take it out of there. But while the debate about who pays for what rages on, these people are left unarmed against the dangers to come. They can rely on nothing but themselves and the faint hope that help might come from somewhere, anywhere that can afford to invest in a solution.